So I have an announcement about this Tuesday. As you guys know, um, this next week is Revival Week, and more about that later. Um, but this Tuesday, we usually have dress-up days, um, but this day is going to look a little bit different. Instead of dressing up, we want you to do the opposite of that. Because um, I think a lot of time we look on the outward reflection, and I want you to look on the inside. So instead of getting up early and, you know, for girls doing your makeup and doing your hair and looking all whatever, all perfect and stuff, um, and the guys doing your hair and looking all nice, um, try not to do that um, and, and focus on the inside instead of seeing how others see you. Look, Try and see how God sees you on the inside. Um, obviously, you don't have to do it, but it'd be cool. It's fun, so, okay. Hi, guys. I have an announcement that is lit. No, 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 not just lit. It is Lit City. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Mary, so much. Hello, guys. We got Jump Force tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. in the CoLab in the Student Center. It is only $3 to enter, and the winner will get a gift card of their choosing. It's going to be fun. Jay's is going to explain about the game, and Ellie, you better come here with middle school mentality. <laughs> All right, so it's just like a fighting game, but with anime characters, and just contact me or Kobe if you want to join All right, so Team Ecuador is going to have a trivia night on March the 12th from 6 o'clock to whenever we're done. If you want to join it, it, you need two people on a team, so two people on a team, $5 per person. The winner will get a gift card. Thank you. Hey, guys. Team Romania. March the 16th, we're going to do a dodgeball tournament starting at 6.30 here in the gym. Teams will consist of 10 people, $20 per team. So get with myself, Mallory, or anyone on Team Romania to get yourselves set up, get your teams together, and let's come out and have a good time playing dodgeball for Team Romania. And now I'd like to introduce my friend Steve, and he's going to tell you all about Romania. Thank you, Billy. Uh, my name is Steve Mather. I'm with Stepping Forward. Uh, we've been in Romania for almost 20 years. And uh, today, I've just got a few slides, if you would uh, be so kind to go with me here. This is our camp uh, a couple of weeks ago before I came on this trip. Um, it kind of looks like Missouri last week, right? Okay. Uh, this is the rec center that we built last year, uh, the team from Central. Everything that's brown on that building was painted by a Central student. So uh, great job last year, and we're looking forward to some good things this year. Um, here we are building the foundation. We'll just kind of go through these fast. Uh, walls, okay. Uh, there are some of those green uh, bo or brown boards that uh, the, the team painted. They're being put up, okay. There I am putting the roof on, all right. That's not that So inside, there's a cool basketball court. It's not as nice as yours, but it's, it's, it's great for the kids, okay. Uh, last year, we had quite a bit of rain, and so the kids from... And we're talking about kids from the orphanage that we work with in Bucharest. Um, come up every week and have a week of camp, okay? Uh, we have worship time, okay? Uh, after the worship time, we have small group meetings. This is really where we can share the gospel with these kids um, that are living in orphanages. So it's a really good time for them to be out of the city and uh, hear the gospel. Um, here we are having meals. Of course, that's really fun, okay? Uh, we play games outside. Uh, piggyback rides. We have a nice slip and slide that we got last year. We're going to make it longer this year. Um, that's a typical group of kids uh, every week. All right. Uh, we have a new set of missionaries from Texas this year. So, hey. Uh, these are the kids uh, that are living in the orphanage in Bucharest. So, that gives you an idea. There's a social worker there, and we do crafts and things. We also take them out to the movies um, or to the park. Um, there's the park. Um, we also take them to the dentist. We get their teeth fixed and that kind of stuff. All right. Um, we give them Christmas presents. A lot of times this is the only Christmas present they receive, so it's really a big deal. Um, this year, the team that's coming is going to build uh, a, two sets of cabins right back here in this 
back side of our camp. There's actually going to be eight new cabins this year. So we're really excited about that. And uh, so what can you do to be involved in stepping forward? Well, you can come to Romania next year and be on the team. So I encourage all of you to uh, pray about that and uh, hope to see you in Romania. Thank you very much. Uh, next Thursday, March 7th, is Day of Service, so you won't have classes, and there will be more announcements about that later, but we also have Men's Banquet next Thursday, so we will have lots of projects for you to do here on campus and to help with the banquet. Um, men, go ahead and stand up. Because you are a student, this banquet has already been paid for in your student service fees, and you are welcome to come for free that night. Bob Russell is our speaker. Um, if you've not heard of him, you need to look him up. Ladies, go ahead and join the men standing. I need 20 of you to help me serve drinks to the men. It's just one of the special things we do. They get up and get their plates, but we serve their drinks. So I'll have a sign-up sheet up by the mailboxes, or you can see me. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to come to my office or to email me. Um, and I'm assuming Christian will have more about day of service for you later, but part of the projects are to help with men's banquet, and others are to clean up campus and some other things. So we hope that you will all participate. You don't have to go to class, so um, this would be a great thing for you to do. Um, let's go ahead and pray before we start worship. Father God, you're good, and we love you. We are getting ready to worship you with music right now, and I just pray, Father, that you will open our hearts and minds to the message and to... Um, and just to your love, Father, help us to serve you better each day. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Sing it out. Come on, let's turn it up. We're gonna sing it out for all the world to hear. Oh, 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 oh. There's life for everyone. A new day has begun. Something to shout about. Let it be known that our God saves, our God reigns. We lift you up, up. Let it be known that love has come, love has won. We lift you up, 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 whoa! Nothing can stop us now, no one can keep us down. We found our voice again, oh, 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 oh. No need for fear and shame, there's power in his name. Come on, let freedom reign. Let it be known that our God saves. Our God reigns, we lift you up, up, let it be known that love has come, love has won, we lift you up, 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 whoa! We lift your name up higher and higher. We lift your name up. We shout your name out louder and louder. We shout your name out. We lift your name up higher and higher. We lift your name up, Jesus. We shout your name out louder and louder. We shout it out now. Love has won. We lift you up, up, up. Whoa. 
Jesus be glorified. Your ways are higher than mine. Washed away every stain, Lord. Greater love than the blood, Lord. Jesus be glorified. Your ways are higher than mine. Washed away every stain, Lord. No greater love than the blood, Lord. said, walk out on the waves, for I am with you. You said you never change, and I believe you. You broke my chain. Jesus. 
Father, we know that you, you reign, that your kingdom will reign forever. And it's not just uh, in some distant place thousands of years from now, but it's right here and now on this earth that you're establishing your kingdom and we get to be a part of that. Father, thank you for using us in your plan to redeem this world. I just ask that we would, that we would keep in mind that, uh, that our God saves and our God reigns. And it's only through your son's sacrifice that, that it's possible for us to know you in an intimate way. And God, I ask that you would help us to use this time every week to just uh, pause and reflect and be grateful for uh, the ability to worship you for that, that gift that you've given us. And I just ask that you would be with us and help us to zone in now and listen to this message and uh, help us all to take it to heart. Help us to get something out of it. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Guys, I'm really quite excited. I'm excited that I get, I'm excited that I'm announcing our speaker, but I'm not excited that I'm up here announcing. I'm excited <laughs> because of who our speaker is. You guys, you guys get the idea. Um, the, our speaker, uh, he's really one of the coolest youth ministers ever. And it's true, in fact, people have told me that, and which my response has been, you know, I'm a youth minister, but they insist that he's really the coolest youth minister ever. But if you ever get to spend any time with him, and I hope that you do, you'll quickly realize the same thing. He graduated in 2009. Um, uh, since then, he's continued on and gotten some additional education uh, from Liberty University in pastoral counseling and theology. While he was here, he was one of those people on campus that when he was around, there was a new sort of energy. Uh, this, this dude, he loves Jesus. He loves people. Uh, and when he's around, you, I think you get a glimpse of what it means to really follow Jesus. Uh, since he's graduated, he's been in youth ministry. Uh, he's been an event speaker. He's going to be back here speaking at Crazy Days this year as well. I'm really excited to announce Clarence Hogan. slide right now. I'm going to let it slide. Well, I am, I am super excited to be here with you this morning. Um, anything that, any of the things that were said about me, I obviously cannot take credit for any of those. Um, I feel like, some days I feel like a failure in youth ministry, and if you haven't, if you're in youth ministry, if you haven't felt that, one day you will, okay? It will, it will happen one day. And uh, I, but I hail from uh, the wonderful state of Indiana. I need Hoosiers in the house. Okay, some of you out there. All right, um, uh, it's, it's cold and it's uh, incredibly weird to live there, but I love it. Um, and it's a great place to live. Um, as a matter of fact, Ashley, somewhere over here somewhere, uh, she interned with me last summer, and I'm actually looking for an intern this summer. <laughs> but um, Ashley interned with us last summer, and it was a great time. Um, Goshen is the land of the Amish people. Uh, if you know anything about Amish, uh, Goshen is one of those places where there are horses and buggies and green stuff everywhere. I'll, I'll let you decide what the green stuff is. But this is stuff everywhere, and so... Um, it's been a wonderful place to live. I'm in a wonderful, wonderful church uh, that's really a stretch for me. It's actually, it used to be a Mennonite church, um, and so people would walk around with the little doilies and stuff like that on their heads, and uh, some of them still do, and we have lots of Amish people that come into the church. It's just a really crazy place, um, but I am excited to be here with you this morning. I'm excited to crack open God's Word with you, and so if you would, could you stand with me for a second? When I was growing up, when we would often read Scripture we would read it, we would read our opening text and we would stand up. So my opening text this morning is from 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 through 19. It reads like this, Naaman, a commander of the army of Syria, was a great man with his master in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria, and he was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Um, now the Syrians, uh, on, on one of their raids, came off, uh, carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. 
She said to her mistress, would that, would that my Lord were the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, thus and spoke to the girl from the land of Israel and the king of Syria, now go and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, he went taking them his 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Uh, and he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Brother, want to fight. That's what he's saying. <laughs> but when Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him now come to me, that he may know there is a prophet in Israel. I'm already ready to preach. Let me, let me calm down a little bit. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house, and Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven, seven times, and your flesh will be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana, Parfar, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm getting these wrong. I, I don't know how to announce, pronounce them. Uh, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel. Could I not wash in them and be clean? And so he turned and he went away in a rage. But his servants came near to him, to, near to him and to say, My father, it is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? He has actually said it to you. Wash and be clean. And so he went down, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word, of, the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. That's probably where the statement, baby's bottom, comes from, okay? <laughs> then he returned to the man of God, and in, in all of his company, he came and he stood before him, and he said, Behold, I now know that there is a God in the earth, but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, if not, please let it there be given to a servant uh, two mule loads of earth. From now on, you and your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice uh, to any god but the Lord. And this man of the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship, there leaning on my arm, and I bow myself to the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself to the house, in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. And he said to him, go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, may the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. As I looked at this text and as I began to study this text, I'll give you a title. I did not pick the title, okay? The title was given to me, so if you, you want to send hate mail, don't send it to me, okay? A prophet, a leper, and a king walk into a bar, okay? That's the title. I did not pick that, but I'm going to preach that, okay? So, one of the things that I've noticed that in this scenario of this story is one of the things that as I was reading through the story, I said to myself, Naaman must have thought it is not supposed to happen this way. You see, Naaman was a man. He was the captain of the host. He was known as a five-star general. He was honorable. He was a mighty man of valor, but he had an issue. He was a leper. And if you know anything about being a leper in biblical days, it means that you had an awful skin condition with a nasty, and, and it was nasty and painful, and it left you a mess. Very often people have equated to having leprosy to a sin condition in your life, and it is a representation of the sin that's really going on in your life. Some even call it a punishment as a result of sin. But one of the things about lepers is they live in living conditions that most of us would not really want to live in. I remember last summer we went to Jamaica on a mission trip. Anybody ever been to Jamaica? 
Okay. Jamaica is an amazing place. And so, you know, when I'm gearing up for a mission trip, now I'm from Detroit, and so I, my life was lived like a mission trip, okay? Uh, so, but, but, but to be honest with you, when I'm gearing up for a mission trip, I had no idea uh, what this mission trip was going to be like. I've been on several before. I've been in mostly third world countries. And so we went, and uh, some youth pastor had the bright idea to take 76 teenagers to on one trip. I don't know who he was, but he needs to be fired, okay? But so we took 76 teenagers on one trip, and we all went to Jamaica. And the missions organization that we th- went through thought it would be a great idea for all of us to have matching shirts. Okay, but the problem is this mission organization uh, sends out over 10,000 teenagers every summer on mission. So as you can imagine, as we get to Midway Airport, uh, we show up with 73 of us in our little uh, manly salmon shirts. I, that's what I call them. We show up there, and we notice that there are five or six other busloads of other students that are traveling with this missions group that are going to other parts of the country. So I'm like, how do we distinguish who our kids are? Because to be honest with you, none of my kids except one and a half maybe look like me, okay? So I didn't know who was who, Okay. And so as we went on this trip, we got to Jamaica. It was good. We was out the airport, and we were eating stuff, and then we drove a long way, and then we got to the place in which we stayed. And the first thought in my mind was, God, it doesn't have to be like this. And we, we got into our, our, our makeshift facility. I don't know what it was. You had to drive 40 minutes up a mountain and, you know, all this stuff. And we got in there, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, it stretched me to the core, but we got up there, and y'all, there were rats coming across the rafters. There were spiders, and there was some random bug that laid uh, eggs on my bed every night, and I was just not feeling the mission. I was feeling like, Naaman, does it have to be like this? And so as we went through the week, uh, I really learned that God was really teaching me some things, and I'm not really sure what he was teaching me yet. I'll let you know when I learned it, but it was a hard place. And I thought to myself very often, it does not have to be like this. But what I didn't know, God was calling me to die to myself. He was calling me to die to my own will. He was calling me to die to my own comfort. He was calling me to die in a place that I had built up some kind of thing that thought I was owed something by somebody. He was causing me to die to that. But people who were lepers, they were unclean. No one could touch them. They had boils. There was no cure for it. And basically, this dude, Naaman, was toe up from the flow up. If you don't know what that statement means, Google it. You'll figure it out. But what happened is our brother Naaman, he needed a miracle that only God can do. And I don't know where you stand this morning, and I don't know what you are uh, into, and I don't know what's happening in your life, but there, there, there are some people maybe in this room who need something from God and know that only he can be able to do that thing that you need. Naaman needed a miracle that only God can do, and but, but what began to happen was an unlikely miracle came through an unlikely person in an unlikely place. And very often God shows us that. Uh, if we were to go back to 2 Kings of 5, verses 4 through 7, it kind of reads like this. It says, uh, so Naaman went in and told his Lord, thus he spoke to the girl from the, from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now, and I will send a letter to the king. And so he went up taking his 10,000 of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, that you may cure him of his leprosy. You see, Naaman was... Seeking an unlikely miracle through unlikely people in an unlikely place. And so he arrived in style. You ever seen somebody arrive in style? You know, you look at them, and they, they come in, they got all this stuff, and you're like, oh, that person must be somebody important. And most people, they're not really anybody important. They're just trying to make themselves seem important. But people look at them, and it's like this person is arriving in style. And that's what Naaman did. He arrived with all of his chariots. He arrived with all of his things. And he arrived in probably similar fashion than he would arrive anywhere else. But there was something different about this day. You see, maybe the answers that you are seeking from God will come through people in your life that seems like they are the polar opposites of who you are. You see, so Naaman arrived, and he got there, and I, I could just imagine myself, if I arrive, and I'm, I'm coming with my, uh, you know, my, my Ford Focus, <laughs> you know, ain't, ain't much fanfare about no Ford Focus, but I'm coming with my Ford Focus, and I'm arriving in style, one headlight, hello, hello, hello somebody, and I'm arriving in style, and I get to this place, and I'm like, wait a minute. This is not at all what I was expecting. Is it supposed to be like this? And so Naaman got there. He arrived. And I, I honestly thought, <laughs> maybe he said, ugh, Jesus, why? Why them? Like, why, do, why does my miracle have to come through these people? 
I remember one particular occasion a couple weeks ago. Um, I don't like ice. I don't like driving on ice. Um, Indiana is full of ice and Amish. You know, that's, that's what we got. That's what we have to offer. And who's your basketball at some point? Okay, that's what we have to offer. Okay, and so I remember a few weeks ago, I had just come home from uh, Chicago, and I was driving, and I was going to meet some of uh, my church family, and I was driving around the corner, and all of a sudden, my car lost control. I slid through the ice right to somebody's front yard, and my car is stuck there, and I'm thinking, oh, help me, Father. And so I get out of the car, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? I'm stuck in somebody's yard, and the people, the, the yard I got stuck in, the people happened to be Amish. Now... I don't know how much we know about Amish people, but just recently, a few weeks ago, before that, I, I preached a sermon about racism, and I had talked about how much racism that there is in the Amish community, and people, all of my friends had told me, the Amish do not like people with darker skin, so yo, your boy was scared. <laughs> and so I got there, and, and all of a sudden, the guy comes, Jedediah comes out, I'm not sure that's not what's the name, but Jedediah comes out. Jedi Miller or Yoder or Bontrager or, you know, one of those names. He comes out and he's like, oh, man, I see you got stuck in the yard there. And I'm like, yeah, I just, I made a big accident and I don't really know what to do. And I'm like, I'm going to call, you know, my towing company. They're going to come and dig me out. He goes, oh, no, I got a winch. I'll just pull you out. And I'm like, bro, no. Like, like no, seriously, I will call uh, AAA. I will have them come get me. Not a big deal. He goes, oh, no, we'll just tie it to a tree. So him and this other Amish dude, tied it to a tree, and they stood there, and they winched my car out of the yard. And I'm just sitting there like, okay, well, this is not how I planned for it to happen, but whatever. And as I'm sitting there, the Holy Spirit really began to teach me something. Because I had disregarded Amish people because of what somebody else told me who they were. How many times in our life do we disregard somebody that we don't know because of what we heard from somebody else? How many relationships are we missing out on people that we can love and do life with because of what we heard from somebody else? What you heard is going to get you in trouble one day. So I had to repent because I had preconceived notions about them. What if my miracle that I'm seeking in my life depended on how I treat others who are around me and who are different than me? What if my miracle was hinged to how I love on you? What if everything I was praying and asking God for was locked up in a way that I treated the people who were around me? And so I had to apologize. Another thing I found out this year is through working with my church, I've been invited over for Thanksgiving. You boy, I love food, okay? You, I love food, okay? Food is a gift. I love it, okay? It can also be a bad thing, but I love it. And so... Um, I was going to people's house for Thanksgiving, and I show up at the house for Thanksgiving, and I'm like, yo, this is awesome, this is awesome, this is awesome. Uh, where the macaroni and cheese? What you mean? Where is the macaroni and cheese? And not from a box or on a stove. Where is the macaroni and cheese that come out of the oven? You know, the ones where the kids don't get the edges because they're so good. Where, where's that macaroni and cheese at? Oh, we don't eat macaroni and cheese on Thanksgiving. I'm sorry, brothers. I didn't know that. I thought everybody had macaroni and cheese Thanksgiving, but I assumed, and I was wrong. Can I ask you a question this morning? How often do we assume things about other people that we really have no idea about? How often do we make a mental judgment off of just looking at a pe person or just uh, being around a person? How often do you and I miss out on amazing relationships because we already judge the person before we get to know them? I tell people, listen. You're not allowed to hate me until you get to know me. If you get to know me and you hate me, all right, we good. But if you don't know me and you hate me, we're going to have an issue. Some of us will miss out on the richest relationships because we're afraid to cross the line and to love those who are dif different than us and to love those who are difficult. Our fears and our prejudgments of others are honestly ignorance. And we have a crisis in our world and in our church today. And I mean the big C church. Much like Naaman, we have an issue and we're afraid to admit it even though it's staring us in the face. So today we're going to address the elephant in the room. There's an issue in our world and in our churches. And no matter how much we wish it away, it's not going to go anywhere until the elephant is addressed. Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour in all of America. Still. And nothing gets better until the problem is addressed. Just like someone with cancer, until you take care of the issue, it will continue to spread and it will continue to kill you. 
But Naaman had a painfully obvious issue that he could not hide. And so he thought to himself, you want me to do what? Go down and dip in the net, go down and dip in Raphael Park? That's what you want me to do? Don't you know the Lake of the Ozarks is way better than Raphael? Why would you have me go down there? That's where all the kids go to make out. I know it's no different now than in 2004. I'm not, I'm not crazy. I know, I know it ain't no different. And that's what he said. He goes, oh, this water is dirty. And he dips seven times. No, the miracle is supposed to happen like this. You're supposed to wave your hand over me, and I'm supposed to be all right. But God was like, no, bro, it ain't going to happen like that. The prophet said, no, it's not supposed to happen like that. And so he sent his servant girl to speak a word to Naaman, somebody who was least likely told him where his miracle was coming from. And very often... We ignore the least likely because we think that they have no credibility or nothing to say. But I'm telling you, we miss out on the riches of relationships when we don't allow people to speak into our lives. So he was told, go dip in the river several times. And if that was me, I would be like, girl, bye. No. No, not today. Are there better rivers? Is, Is there another way? Why does it have to be this way? But I want to tell you something this morning, beloved. I don't believe that God moves on our terms. That's why he's God. The seasoned saints used to say when I was growing up in church, he's God all by himself. He don't need anybody else's help. And that still rings true even for us today. We are required to take a step in this case, and the step is titled obedience. So my question to you this morning is, does God have your yes? Does God have your obedience? Does God have a yes from you? I'm telling you this morning, beloved, because if God has a yes from you, he can take your yes and do things that you never could imagine, but he's got to have a yes from you. Secondly, this morning, or thirdly, wherever I'm at, (laughs) obedience changed things for Naaman. Naaman's servant led him to a miracle, and the miracle came in an unlikely place with unlikely people, all because of God who was faithful to his word. What about here on this canvas? How many elephants are in the room today? Maybe some of you have said, and I'm getting ready to go there. I'm getting ready to get all up in the Kool-Aid this morning. Maybe some of you have said, why why are they at school here? They're only here to play basketball. They're only here to do this. They're only here to do that. Like I said, it hasn't changed in my day to now. We often make preconceived notions about people that we know nothing about. So what is the elephant in the room today besides the one I just mentioned? What is the elephant in the room today with our students? Are we really loving each other like we've been called to love one another? Or are we here to get a degree, pass time, and go on with our life? But if you miss a relationship on the way through, you will never know the richness of the experience you could have had here if you don't get to know those that were around you. When I came to Central in 2004, I was scared. Okay? I, I, I am not from a place that only has three exits, okay? I'm not, listen, I'm not from that place. I'm from Detroit, okay? We got 300 exits and 8,000 potholes, okay? <laughs> it was crazy coming here for the first time. But I tell you what, the staff and the professors, I have never felt so much love, and I have never been embraced so much as I have with the staff and professors. Now, the students, that was a whole other thing. We can talk about that later. But the staff and professors, they have always been a catalyst for leading the way. And I don't believe they ever looked at any of us any different. The problem that we had was within our student body, not the staff. So what about here on campus? What are the elephants in the room today? You see, Naaman had to humble himself and engage and take advice from people who were his servants. Even though Naaman had an attitude, made the king mad, doubted his servants and the prophet, that didn't change the fact that the least of these servants led him to a miracle that only God could do. They did not act off of his response, but they acted out of love and obedience. So my question to you today, again, is how do we respond to those who are different than us? How do we love those who are considered the least of these in the eyes of the world? Or how can we love those who are considered different than we are, who have different theologies, who have different ideologies, who have different all of those things? How do we still find a way to love them? That don't mean I'm going to excuse your mess, but how do I find a way to love you in the middle of your mess? In order to address this issue, 
We've got to have reconciliation with God and reconciliation with one another. John 13, 5 says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Point blank period. That's all. That's what he said. By all this people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world is watching, my friends. And in order to fully address the issue, we have got to begin to have reconciliation. Uh, the writer says, a writer says this, true reconciliation with God cannot hang in midair as an abstraction. It moves right into our hostilities and our resentments toward one another. And let's all admit it, we need help. One of the reasons why people say they don't believe that the gospel is truth is that we Christians come across as living denials of the very reconciliation we claim to celebrate. If our relationships with one another are chilly and distant, how can we commend the gospel to our watching world with persuasive power? Let me say that again. If our relationships with one another are chilly and distant, then how can we commend the gospel to our watching world with persuasive power? They're watching us. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. That clock in the back helps, brother. I'm telling you for real. 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 12 says this, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you the cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about the outward appearance and not what's in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right minds, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died once and for all. Therefore, all have died and he died for all. That those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him uh, for, who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, that's why it's therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though Christ once regarded them according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to him and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. That's all of us. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ, my friends, is the chief reconciler. Not only is the chief reconciler between us and our Heavenly Father, but he is the chief reconciler between us and one another. So it starts with a conversation. We need to seek to listen and not seek to respond. Two, we, be, we need to begin to step into the mess with people. You see, Jesus wasn't afraid to step into the mess. Now, understand this. I tell my students this all the time. If you just got free from being a crack cocaine addict or a drug addict, it's probably not the best advice to go to the crack house the next week you got delivered and to witness to somebody. Okay, don't do that. You can step into the mess, but you ain't got to step into it like that. But you got to step into the mess. You see, Jesus wasn't afraid to do that. Uh, I don't have time to go for it today, but the woman at the well... He stepped into the mess of the, the situation that she made. He's not afraid. But more than all of that, I want you to know that when you step into the mess of what's going on in somebody else's life to help bring them freedom, I want you to know that your proximity changes your perspective. The closer you get to something, the more, the more, the more relational you can be through it. Why? Because you're walking close with it, and you know that person, and you know what they've been through. You know their story. And so proximity, my friends, will change your perspective. Three, it has to be intentional. People are tired of empty promises and phony people. Number two, it has to be relational. I remember uh, I, I was really, really praying about uh, reaching a guy at the gas For some reason, God always puts me in situations where I'm talking to people at the gas station about faith, and everybody behind me is mad. But I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to sit here as long as I'm with Everybody going to get saved up in here tonight. 
And so I, for, for Christmas, uh, uh, Professor Regina Green, who I love, uh, God bless her. Uh, she, she passed away years ago, but she's a great asset here at Central. She always taught me. Now, she didn't say it in these terms because we didn't use those words yet, but she always told me to treat yourself, okay? And so every year for Christmas, I treat myself, okay? And I got me this little Sherpa coat. It's a little hipster coat, something I, I probably would never wear, but it was really cool looking, okay? And so I kept going into this gas station, and I've been praying about ministering to this guy who is way different than me. I've been praying about God. How can I minister to this guy? How can I reach him? And so I was in there one day. I went up to the cash register, got my Gatorade as I do every single night. I uh, went up to the cash register, was talking to him, and he looks at me and he goes, hey, I like your coat. I'm like, yeah, cool. I like it too. It's really cool. It's got the Sherpa, but it costs a lot of money. I ain't get, I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I, gotta, I only wear it sometimes. And so I got myself, went out to my car, and just I couldn't, I couldn't knock, I couldn't, uh, I had this strange feeling inside that I needed to give dude my coat. And so as I'm walking back to the car, me and God are arguing. I'm like, God, I just bought that coat. Like, that was a treat yourself coat. Like, he got a coat. He don't even need this coat. I, this is the only coat I got. I, that's not true. But, you know, I, I'm like going back and forth with God. I'm like trying to reason. And God's like, but give, give the man the coat. So I walk inside. And I, I hand it to him. And I give him the coat. And he starts crying. And I just say, God bless you. And I'm still praying for an opportunity to reach him. And I hope he ain't sell my coat because uh, I don't know why I gave it to him. But sometimes God will cause us to be stretched out of areas beyond our wildest imagination. If God is stretching you, allow him to do what he's meant to do in your life. Three, it needs to be steeped in love, not an agenda. Four, we need to live on mission every day. I tell my students, we're not just going on a mission trip. We are living on mission. And then when we leave this place, we're going on mission to somewhere else. Five, ask God to stretch you. Ask him to put you in uncomfortable places. Pray dangerous prayers. Pray prayers that will shake the absolute core of your faith. Lastly, this morning, I want you to know that not loving your neighbor isn't an option. I don't have to agree with you to love you. And I think that in 2019, we have forgot that, that I have to agree with somebody to love you. I can still love you and not agree with what you do. I can still love you and not agree with what you say. I can still show you God's love, but baby, I don't have to agree with you. You don't have to agree with somebody to love them, and that's the mistake that we have all gotten wrong. Not loving your neighbor isn't an option. You must love your neighbor. Next that, that God would help all of us see everyone through the lens of the Imago Day. That means in the image of God. Every single person was created in the image of God, and we ought to treat them as such. If we all have Jesus in common, maybe we can start with that. And so this morning, my, my challenge to you is that will you take a step? Will you be the catalyst that gets the world's attention? Will you be the catalyst that gets the church's attention? Will you be the unifier in the body of Christ that looks at people who are different than you and says, it doesn't matter where you came from, whether you're from my hood or that hood, I'm going to love you. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done for both of us. He is our common ground. So will you take a step this morning? Will you be the catalyst that gets the world's attention? And my prayer is that you would begin to ask God in ways that he can stretch you, in ways that you can step out. And so I want to offer this prayer to you, and I want you to remember as you go throughout this week, I want you to, I want you to think about these words. God, stretch me so that I am completely uncomfortable so that I may love those who are different than me. Very simple prayer. God, stretch me till I'm uncomfortable so that I can love those who are around me regardless of what I see with my eyes, God, stretch me so that I can love them. And lastly, 1 John 4.20 says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he, sorry, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So this morning, where will you be challenged at today? Where will you allow your faith to be strengthened? Where will you allow... God to stretch you in your life? Will you be like Naaman who thought that he had it all together and thought that it wasn't supposed to happen that way? Or will you humble yourself, submit yourself, step out of your box, stop judging people with what you see with, with your eyes and get to know people who are made in the image of God? Because God does not make junk. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you.
I thank you for the opportunity that we have to love people through the Imago Day, God. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to put ourselves on the back burner, God. I thank you for the opportunity that we have, God, to love without limits, God. So help us, God. The world is watching, God. So help us to love one another so that we can con- convince the world that there is love, that persuasive power of the cross and what you have done for us is legitimate and is active and working in our lives today. God, we give you the glory, God, and let us leave this place with the ability to be stretched and to love those who are different than us, knowing, God, that you are our common purpose. I don't have to agree with you or agree with what you do, and I can tell you the truth, but I do have to love you because love is what makes a difference. God, we love you and we thank you for all this. In your name we pray and everybody said, Amen. God bless you guys. I love you.